there's people out here who see it, man. People pretend to be something they're not. And I mean, I've seen people put so much effort into pretending to be something they're not that it would probably be easier to actually go do it. I just, I just couldn't understand that. But anyways, uh, blood's three phases, and I'll talk briefly on each. All right, first phase, second phase, and third phase. First phase, it's been a while since I've been through there. I, I can't, I don't really remember. I think first phase is 12 or 13 weeks. Second phase is 11 weeks, and third phase, or second phase is uh, 11 or 12 weeks, and third phase is chemistry. I think so, cool. First phase is just a gut check, the beat down, mental and physical torture to make sure you have what it takes to go into follow on training. Second phase is dive phase. It's actually what separates us from the other special forces is our ability to work underwater. 73.42% of the globe is covered in it. It could be anywhere on in 24 hours. It's kind of our mantra. You know, when I was a scuba diver before I got into the SEAL team to learn how to dive at a young age, I don't really remember what a normal dive is. What, 60 feet? Any divers in here? Is it 60 feet, 60 minutes? Yeah, something like that.
uh, Ax was right here, 12 feet from me on the right side, and Mikey would move back and forth. Sun had come up. Nothing was going on. Heard some women yelling, some kids crying, and a mule bellowing. Um, Ax and Mikey left. Dan, they left Danny and I there to watch the target. They came back about an hour later. We all packed up shop, climbed to the top of the mountain, which is 30 feet above us, got onto this finger, and started pushing down it. All eight, probably 800 meters long. At the very end, it dropped off. There's a big stump right here. It was all burned up and hollowed out. The left, a bunch of bushes around it, some boulders. Axe, our primary sniper, it's his job to eliminate the threat, laid up right there. The tree that came from the stump was laying right beside it. It was all burned up and hollowed out as well. We think we're in a logging area because most of the bigger trees have been cultivated. I laid down parallel to it, cocked my body around, pulled my chest underneath, rolled my rifle up. I could see everything. I was his spotter and the secondary sniper. Mikey got to my left, probably where those speakers are right there, I, in some rocks. I lost sight of him. And then Danny got behind me probably 20 feet on the back side of the, the, uh, the finger. And he had the only piece of shade on the mountain. I remember that because uh, <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. Daytime was about 110, 115 degrees. At night it wasn't bad. It was two or negative something because it would rain and snow on us. So <laughs> I remember about an hour or so went by and I remember asking Danny. I was like, hey, man, you want to switch? I couldn't see him. <laughs> he just raised his hand and shot me the finger. And I was like, all right. And then I was like... <laughs> I order you to give me that spot. <laughs> and he just shot me the finger again and it was over with. Because rank doesn't mean anything to us while we're out there. We're a family. We're brothers. It's Marcus, Axe, and Danny Boy and whatever. When we get back to the rear, the highest ranking guy has to answer for our screw-ups. That's how it works in the teams. So whatever happens, they're going to throw it on me and I'm going to throw it off on Mikey because he was the, uh, the officer. That's how it works. So we were watching the target and all of a sudden a pair of little brown legs jumped over the muzzle of my gun. Let me tell you something, it got my attention fast. I didn't hear this guy, I didn't see him, the biggest thing was I didn't smell him. When we get over there, our senses are so heightened, we pick up stuff that we normally wouldn't while we're over here. And it got, let me tell you something, it got my attention fast. All I could smell was burnt, wet wood. I tried to wiggle my way out from underneath that tree, and as I came up with my rifle to engage, he turned around, looked at me, had an axe in his hand. Well, what's your natural reaction after somebody scares you? You get mad at them, right? The same thing happened to me, I'm a human being. I jumped over that log, uh, subdued him, took that axe away from him. He had a big, long beard. If anybody has one of those and you want to get their attention, you grab them by it. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. So I rolled my fist up in his beard and uh, I walked back to where Danny was. I was like, get out of the way. I got to interrogate this guy. I was just trying to get his shade, actually. But, that's what... but uh, in the beginning, in the beginning, I was trying to tell him I wasn't going to kill him. I was like, look, man, I ain't going to kill you. You can relax. But you can bet most SEALs, we don't pay attention in language class because we don't care what language you speak. We don't go over there and talk to people. Everybody understands what this means, all right? If you ain't on the ground by the time my rifle muzzle comes back up and put a big hole in you, that's what that means. Most of the stuff we learn is to scare them, all right? We'll get over in country, our interpreters will walk up to us and be like, what do you want to learn how to say? Like, all right, teach me how to say, Allah sent me, and there's no way in hell you're getting out of this, all right? Because what, <laughs> most of the time, we, uh, because <laughs> we, we, we paint our faces up, all sadistic and crazy and wear these cat eye contacts and vampire teeth and Christmas time we got Santa hats I probably shouldn't be telling you all this but uh yeah I was trying to tell this jury I was like look man I ain't gonna jack you up and about five three to five minutes later axe whistled up he's like there's two more there's another adult male he was somewhere between the age of 20 and 90 I don't have any idea how old they are or anything and a kid that kid was probably 12 to 14 now those jokers are lethal you turn your back on a 12 year old boy he'll cut your head off and play soccer with it I use that analogy because I've seen it happen so we zip tied him sat him down all the mountains in Afghanistan they came upon, they came upon the one we were sitting on. In their world, that's inshallah. God willed that. In our world, it's Murphy's Law. We had Murphy with us, so bad stuff always happened to us. <laughs> but um, I know everybody would like to think war is black and white. You can write every scenario that's ever happened in every war and every engagement down in a book and tell us what you want us to do when we run into that kind of stuff. But war is not black and white. It's gray. And if you don't fight in the gray area, you're going to lose. And that's my opinion. That's the last one I'm going to give you. But you should probably pay attention to it. So... We ran through every scenario we could think of, man. Biggest, our biggest focus was the guy down in the village that we'd been chasing for two years. All right, so we turned him around to eliminate the threat. About that time, 70 or 80 goats came bebopping up the mountain, every side of it. Changed the whole dynamic of the mission. And I know you're wondering why, but listen, when those goats, they don't wait on those shepherds. They go back up, follow that trail they've been following for 2,000 years, go back down to that village. They show up without the shepherds, the whole village comes back looking for them, make sure nothing bad happened to them. And if anything kind of feels uneasy or out of place, that guy we've been chasing and, and got him in that village is gone. We ran through some other stuff, but eventually, I mean, every scenario you could think of, zip tying everything, zip tying the goats, all the goats together, I was like, I didn't bring enough. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and goats are resilient. You zip tie five of them together, they're still going to wind up in that village with a zip tie around a leg said, made in America. Where do you think that came from? <laughs> so some other stuff came into play, and, and bottom line is, like, you know, after we, we're not murderers. All right, there's a few things the military don't play around with. That's rape, revenge, and robbery. You can guarantee that. We don't mess around with that crap. So we cut them loose, all right, and would rather deal with a gunfight than the alternative. And they were gone in a shot. It took them 15 minutes to get out of our line of sight. 15. It took us over an hour to climb up the same hill. That's how fast they are. Did it with their hands behind their back and a pair of flip-flops. Didn't even look back at us. Well, we got up and relocated back into those trees in that triangle formation. I was at the top. Danny was right here. Axe right here. And Mikey was moving back and forth underneath me. I pulled my cat down over my eyes to get some rest. I don't know how much time went by. Danny picked up security. Well, all of a sudden, I hear, I hear him signaling. And I raise my cap up. And Mikey's right underneath me. Axe had moved over. And Danny was on the radio. And they were looking past me. And Mikey's eyes, I remember them, I'll never forget them. They're bigger than sand dollars, man. And then the smell hit me in the face, I could smell them. My rifle's right here, I cradled it, rolled my head up like this. And the first guy I saw had an RPG over each shoulder. And there's probably 30 or 40 guys standing right above us, looking down into us. Coming down each ridge line was a couple dozen guys, all right, surrounding us. Oh, right above me was a tree, a big tree, bigger than the rest of them. And all of a sudden, I see a shroud and an AK muzzle peek around the tree, all right. I throw my weapon on fire. He kind of pulls his head back around. You could hear him talking and setting up out of my peripheral. I could see him all moving around and everything like that. I looked under my armpit at Mikey. I was like, get on the clock. We're fixing to get it on. And then all that stuff starts happening. Hair on the back of your neck. Stands up. Throat gets kind of dry. And I just waited on that guy at that tree. As soon as he pulled his head around that tree again, I dumped him. And when I dumped him, it unleashed hell on our left flank. Small arms fire, belt fed stuff. No rockets yet. No mortars yet or anything like that. It was so loud, I was screaming at the top of my lungs at Danny and Mikey, and they couldn't understand a word I was saying. I was dug in pretty deep. I had these two or three little trees right beside my head. Well, the rounds were hitting in the dirt right beside me and coming above me. And Danny had moved around to the backside of his tree because they were just flooding in so hard and fast, and Mikey had ducked down behind Axe, who was behind a, a rock. And um, we all started engaging, right out and up. And... I don't know how much time went by. I don't ever look at my watch in a gunfight, man. But um, all of a sudden, those rounds started busting through that tree right beside my head. And eventually, I got shot in my weapon system. All right? And when I leaned off the mountain, luckily, it hit me in my, in my magazine and not in my rifle. When I dropped my mag to load another one, um, just to clarify, bullets go into a magazine. Magazine goes into a gun. All right? It's not clip. Don't call it a clip. It sounds ridiculous. So I, I looked down at Mikey, and he was giving us the signal to fall back. My pack was wrapped around my calf. When I reached down to grab it, that shelf I made broke. Like somebody opened a trap door underneath me. I slid right out of it. And I don't know what my foot hit, a tree root or a rock, but it stopped me dead track. When my chest came up over my hips, I started to flip. And I flipped out of control. And when I hit Mikey, I was upside down and backwards. My legs came over his shoulders. And I busted him right off that little perch he was on. He didn't see me coming. I hit him. About 276 pounds on me back then. And we just started pinballing in those trees. And, I, you know, you always see somebody on TV falling down a mountain or something like that. You're like, hey, moron, reach out and grab something. Stop yourself. I tried that. And it just ripped right out of my hand. Worst of all, it flipped me in a different direction. But we pinballed through those trees for 200 yards at least and broke through that tree line. And we, I remember the sun hitting me real hard. And I did, it felt like the, it's weird, but it felt like the world was coming around us. It's hard to explain. After flipping for so long, you're just so disoriented. But what I did... Probably three or four flips of my legs extended. And that grass area that we hit was boulders and trees. And the grass had grown up in between it. And we didn't, we didn't see that. And we hit it. I landed on my back, broke my back. Mikey landed on his face, crushed his face. I sat up. I looked at him. I, I was like, are you okay? And that's when they hit us with the RPGs and the mortars. And everything just started blowing up around us. And it was like running an obstacle course trying to get through all that crap. We finally got to some trees that were laid over the top of each other. And we flipped into those. Kind of gained our composure, turned back around, and started to engage. Axe was coming down our left flank, running, all in the mail. Took a round in the back, came out of his left rib, dropped him on his face. Didn't see him again until he crawled into the trees we were in. Spit out a whole bunch of blood, turned around, didn't say one word, typical axe, and started to fire his weapon at the guys who shot him. And Danny was nowhere to be found. He was still up in the trees on the radio, calling in for help. Well, we were there for a while, talking about how we needed to get back up to get Danny. And then all of a sudden, you see his lifeless body flip out of the trees. And he hit the rocks. We thought he was dead. So we made a movement. We all got up to go get him. He sat up and started making his way down to us. 
And he came up about, I don't know, 20, 30 feet shy. I crawled out, grabbed him, drug him in. We both flipped into those trees. I sat him up. I was like, please tell me that you got the call off, bro. What's going on, man? Did anybody know what we're in or what's going on? It's so loud. Face to face, he, understand. he couldn't hear a word I was saying. He was trying to read my lips. Well, eventually, he just put, put his hand in front of my face like this. And in the movie, you see he got shot. If anybody's seen the movie, they shot him and his, his fingers were gone. That's not how, what happened. They shot his thumb off. And it was, actually, it was actually severed, but it was hanging right here. And he was just, he, you know. And um, I picked his rifle back up. He started to bandage his hand up. I shoved his, hand, his rifle into his chest. He turned around and started fighting. Well, by this time, they pushed down the ridge, and they were past us now. And the only place we had to go, this was our second big fall, uh, was about 40 feet down. And we tried to slide off of this rock, but we just, we fell. And I think what would, what would really happen is one guy was sliding off and fell and reached up to grab his buddy so he wouldn't fall, and he was just hooking his buddy up because we just all went out. Well, there was another ridge stuck off to the side of it, and there was a bunch of shrubs and trees and bushes and everything stuck down in that. Well, we just broke through all that stuff. And when we hit the ground, we landed on top of each other, and we got stuck. I mean, we pancaked. And they just started shooting down into that hole we were in, and everybody got hit. Danny got the worst of it. He took a round through the throat and under the clavicle. We untangled ourselves, we got up, and we pushed out into this, uh, into this draw, and we fanned out, and we started pushing down the mountain. Now, the gun battle lasted for over three hours. And um, I, what I'm about to tell you doesn't make any sense. I, I, I know it doesn't. I mean, every time I say it, it doesn't make any sense, but while we were in it, it made perfect sense. So in the beginning of the gun battle, if you were somewhere where you weren't falling, and ineffective fire came in, which means ineffective fire means somebody has their, you in their sights, but it hadn't hit you yet, your natural reaction is to what? You move, okay, to get out of that line of fire, that fatal funnel that we were in. The problem was you'd fall. Every time you fell, you broke something. By the end of the gunfight, if you were somewhere where you weren't falling, you wouldn't leave it until you got shot because the fall was worse. I know that doesn't make any sense, but that's the way it was. Danny took a, a, a pretty bad fall and uh, broke both his femurs and his compound fracture on one leg and I, like I said, I was a medic. It was my job to patch these guys up, so I, I don't know. But he'd been shot three times that I know of. Well, I would drag him. I would drag him and throw him up against something. He and I were together. Axe and Mikey were together. And we had our own little fire team. I'd, I tried to pick him up over my shoulder and fireman carry him at least four or five times that I know of, but I'd fall on top of him. And uh, one of the last times I did that, he grabbed my, my harness and pulled me straight to his face, my ear to his mouth, so I could hear him. And he's like, do not do that again. <laughs> and uh, like I said, I probably did more damage to him than the militia because of my weight. But um, we got to an area where uh, <clears throat> it was a dead drop, probably 200 feet. But there was a way we, could, we had to go off and we could slide around this bolt. Hard to explain. But I was like, hey, look, man, I'm going to take the brunt of this fall. I'm going to pick you up, man. When I turn around, we're going to fall back. When we hit the ground, you reach out. No matter how bad it hurts, start grabbing stuff to keep us from falling off this dead drop. You got me? He's like, Roger that, I'm on it. And we finished, finished the magazine a piece, firing our weapons, and I picked him up. And when I turned around to take the brunt of the fall, I spun him right into a bullet. And I hit him in the back of the head and killed him. And, uh, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't pretend to even know why I, uh, I could put my foot somewhere and not get hit, and the guy beside me could. I, I don't know, man. But it killed him right then and there. And, uh, I wasn't ready for his dead weight. It flipped me in a different direction. I face planted into this boulder, uh, smashed my nose through my face. I broke it pretty bad and I bit my tongue in half and swallowed it. And that totally incapacitated me. I was on all fours. Once I threw my tongue back up and I could bleed or I could breathe, I bit down on it, I looked back up, I saw Danny's shoulder. That's all I saw. I crawled back up, we drug I drug him off to the side of some stuff and I don't really want to get into this, but uh, I got blown out of there and shot out of there again. And I, when I finished falling, I got up. I tried to get back up to him. But the problem was, once you fell a certain distance, you couldn't get back up the way you came. Too steep. That was the most frustrating thing I've ever encountered. I'd crawl up three feet, or we'd crawl up three or four feet, and we'd fall six or ten or whatever it was. 200-yard fall or whatever it was. I caught up with Mikey, and he asked me where Danny was. I was like, he's dead. He's up there. He's like, well, let's go. So we all got, got back online and started to push back up the mountain. By this time, they had come up from the village, and they had resupplied over the top of the mountain. So they had us in a 360-degree pin. No matter where we were at, we were getting uh, There was no, what that means is you can't sit down somewhere and fire your weapon. We tried to get up to him. They blew us out of there. 
I was on the left side of the mountain firing laterally at a, cross, at, a, at a group of guys, and I don't know how he got there. I don't remember seeing him, but Axe walked out from behind this hole I was, I was dug into. I almost shot him. He wasn't running. He didn't even have a mag in the well. He walked right past me, sat down Indian style, leaned against my right leg. The ground was on fire real bad right here. Most of the mountain side was on fire by now, but this one was real bad. And I was elbowing him. I was like, man, you've got to get your gun up. You've got to fight. And this is the first time he said something to me that didn't have to do with tactics. He's like, I'm sorry, bro. I can't help you, man. I'm blind. They shot me in the face. And I turned and I looked at him. And then, you know, in the movie, they had him hit back here. He was actually hit right here. And uh, I've, I'm not a doctor, but I've studied combat medicine probably 14 years now. I don't even know how he was talking to me. I don't know how he's alive. The only thing that looked human on him was his bottom lip. That's the only thing I could recognize. I was like, man, you got to get out of here. You just start walking. I'll cover you. And I turned around to give some cover fire. And up on top of uh, the about, I don't know, 70, 80 yards above us, Mikey was out on this boulder, out in the middle of the fatal funnel. No cover, no nothing on our satellite phone. Forgot he had had that. He took two rounds through the chest, spun him like a top, dropped him on his face. And this bothered me so bad. I mean, Danny was dead, and Axe was dying, and Mikey had just been hit. I thought he was dead. I slung my weapon, tried to crawl up to him, couldn't make it. He sat up with his rifle, finished the phone call off, took a round, straightened the spine, dropped him on his face. Well, he sat up again. I was waving my hands. I didn't want to fire my weapon. I was just waving my hands. All I wanted him to do was come down to me. I was like, just get down here to me. I'll carry you out of here, man. I'll get us out of here. And he went left. I lost sight of him. He went behind this rock embankment. Heard his weapon go off. A lot of gunfire in there. Then he started screaming for help. He's like, I need help up here, man. I need help. And then he started screaming my name. He's like, Marcus, you got to help me. You got to help me. He started screaming my name. I never heard anything like that. Ever. Man, woman, or beast. I, I turned around, I was sitting on my boots trying to reload my weapon. He started screaming my name, so it was so terrible, I actually put my weapon down on my knees and covered my ears because I couldn't stand to hear him die. You know, they say every man has his breaking point. I never thought I'd find mine, but I broke right then and there, which makes me a coward, too, because I put my weapon down in a gunfight. That's a cowardice act. I don't know, I just couldn't take it. I broke, couldn't take it anymore. And they killed him. I never saw him again. I got shot out of there. I rolled down. The uh, axe was below me, probably 200 feet, I guess. And there was a couple of logs and there was rock overhang. There was a stream running around and some gravel and stuff like that. He was sitting under there. I crawled in there with him. I was sitting down right in front of him. He'd taken abdominal dressing and pulled his face back together. And uh, I was like, we're going to die. We're going to die right now. You know, I made my peace with God a long time ago about dying. We talked about that earlier. But it's a weird feeling when you know you're about to die, when the reaper's at the door. Most of the time we don't know. We just go out, they shut our light off, it's over. But that was a weird, weird feeling. I was like, we're going to die, man. And an RPG hit behind him. Came in there, blew. I was talking to him. I, remember, I, I still remember what it felt like. The gravel in the, hit me in the back of the throat and blew him on top of me. And when I pushed him up off of me uh, to figure out what was going on, another one hit and blew us out of there. Blew him one way, blew me another I never saw him again for the rest of my life. I came to, I was laid over the back side of this rock. I was paralyzed from the waist down. I had been shot, I had fray, 11 through and throughs in my quads and calves. Broke my pelvis back, rotator cuff. My maxillofacial damage was pretty substantial. Now, all my kit, med gear, GPSs, compasses, all that stuff was gone. I didn't even have any pants on. All I had was boots and my harness was holding my, my, uh, my cami top. That was it. I crawled into this, uh, I rolled over and I started crawling with my elbows and started taking dirt and sand and sticking it into all the open wounds of my body so I wouldn't bleed to death. And I buried myself in a shallow grave. And I crawled into this little crevice, started pulling rocks on top of me. And I could hear the militia and everybody come down off the mountain and celebrate and do what they do to us when they, when they get a hold of us. And it lasted all day. And I started second guessing myself. I was like, man, wait, wait I'm, I, know they're, I know they're dead, bless you. But I, I was like, what if they're not, man? I can't do nothing. I can't move. I just sit in there and listen to them torture the, oh, man, it was rough. As the sun was going down, I could feel my toes. So I was going to try and stand up. So I cleared my area, and I saw something glistening on the other side of the canyon wall. I rolled my scope up. There was a guy leaning against a rock. He was kind of sitting down. He had a silver AK-47. The sun was pinging off of it. That's how I saw him. I took two shots at him and missed him. On the third one, I hit him in the belly, and he fell. He had two buddies with him. I didn't see them either. They came running over and hit on my side of the rock, facing the same direction I was. I had a suppressor on my weapon. They had no idea where it came from. And I shot those two guys in the back. Normally, you're not supposed to shoot people in the back, but I had a pretty bad day, so screw them. <laughs> Sun went down. This is the longest night of my life. 
I, it's impossible for me to even talk to you about everything that happened to me. I knocked myself out at least five times that I can recall on the falls. I didn't have any night vision or anything like that. I, would just, I was like, this is a good way to go, and it wouldn't be. It would be a drop-off, and I'd fall. I never thought one second that my teammates were dead. Most of the time when we're patrolling at night, we can't see each other anyways. We don't use radio comms very much, so I was like, they're in front of me, and they're in back of me. I'm good. And I just crawled all night. As the sun was coming up, I don't know if these people were trailing me all night or if they found me this morning, but I was holding onto a tree, reaching down for another one, and I got shot in the back. And it turned me into a gainer. And I rolled down this hill probably 50, 60 feet, landed on my face. I rolled over. I was like, what? What was that? I mean, it felt like somebody caught me on fire and hit me with a truck. And I was like, Jesus Christ, where'd that come from? You know, I'm, oh, man, it hurt. My adrenaline wasn't up or anything. And, and this guy was screaming at me and pointing at me from the hill I just fell off of. He didn't have a weapon. But these other two jokers on the left flank or on the right flank were moving above me and um, just laying lead on me as hard, as fast as they could. Why? Well, I, I didn't. Nothing worked from my chest down now. I was paralyzed. I just threw my weapon in the crease of my elbows and just used my elbows and would pull myself up the hill. And I would toss myself off the back side of it. That's how I was faster than they were. Figured, you know, I ain't going to quit, man, but if I break my neck and kill myself, that's not really quitting. I broke my neck. I just didn't kill myself. It totally backfired. But I, <laughs> I crawled up, and I got into this rock embankment. I mean, huge. It was like a rock quarry, like this, this size of this thing right here. And I just crawled into that. And I spun around, rolled my rifle up, and waited. And I waited for that spotter. He was chasing me, hilltop for hilltop. I let him walk right into me, from me to the end of the stage. I shot him right in the teeth. And these other two jokers, their high ground turned into my level ground. I had two frags left. I let him walk up on top of me, sent a frag out, and that was it. I was in bad shape now. I was dying. I didn't know what to do. So I reached out and I grabbed a rock. And I reached out as far as I could in front of me, and I drew a line in the sand. And I was like, I'm going to crawl to that until my feet hit it. If I'm still alive, I'm going to do it again. And that's what I did. Crawl to it, my feet would hit it. I'd fall down a hill. I'd crawl up another one. I'd draw another line. Crawl to that. I did that for seven miles, and I found a waterfall. I don't know how I did this. I managed to get to the top of it. I had this great idea. Write this down. This doesn't work. And I was just going to slide down this, this side of this embankment, this waterfall, into the river. Well, I, I just took off. I started gaining speed. I tried to grab a tree to stop myself, and it flipped me upside down. I did a header. I took flight, landed in the river. My head hit a boulder. My knees hit me at the same time, and it split my head open and knocked me out. When I came to, I was laid over the side of this dirt mound. A rifle was laying across my face. I couldn't throw that thing away. It was like Mikey and Danny and actually just sitting there going, you're going to need this. Well, I, got, I rolled over, and I got two sips out of this waterfall, and then somebody was screaming at me again, and two guys with guns were maneuvering around on me. And this was the first time that I'd ever gotten um, up mad. You know, upset, pissed off. And I was like, no more gun play, no more knife play, no more explosives. I was like, come down here, I'm going to kill you with my bare hands. That's, that's how mad I was. I was like, I'm going to beat you to death. And I tried to stand up to show a sign of aggression, and my legs didn't work. I fell. I rolled off this embankment down this hill, and I was like, man. And they could see me. I couldn't see them. I got that sense of impending doom. I rolled my rifle up, trying to get a shot off. They ducked. Well, behind me, about... I don't know, 30 feet, this guy came over this rock ledge, started screaming at me. He's like, American, American. I swung around on him, had my gun at my hip, tension out of my trigger, safety off, and I don't know why I didn't kill this guy. I don't know, I don't know why. I mean, I think, I think about it a lot. He's actually come to visit me a couple of times since this all went down, and we, we talk about this moment, you know, and I'm like, man, I don't know why I didn't kill you, man. He's like, I don't know why I let you live. <laughs> I guess that's a good point. Well, he started walking at me, and he was like, American, American. And I was like, Taliban, Taliban? Like he'd tell me if he was the Taliban or not. And I was like, I was, I was in a bad place. But he got closer to me. He was like, okay, 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 okay. Shampoo hydrate, shampoo hydrate. I was like, shampoo hydrate. I was like, I don't need a hair wash, but if you got some water, I'll take it, Jack. And all those guys that were chasing me came, these kids came out from everywhere and gave me a bottle of water. And then they kind of tilted me over and I sprayed blood in their face. And four guys picked me up. Carried me down into the village, sat me down outside this house, gave me all the water I could drink, picked me up, carried me into this room, and stripped me naked, and doctored me up from head to toe. I'd passed out by now, uh, at this point, but it doctored me up from head to toe, and then dressed me up in a set of those man jammies, complete with hat. I already had a beard down here, so from a distance, I, I, you know, I looked like a villager. He got up on top of me, there was no mistaking what I was. I was in this room for about an hour, and the door kicked open, Taliban flooded the room. I knew immediately who they were. You know, you hunt something long enough, you know what it is when it's staring you in the face. Plus, they spoke English, and they told me they were the Taliban. But I was like, yeah, I, I, was like, yeah, I know who you are. I don't really get into what happened. 
you can use your imagination. Ain't worth talking about. They had me all day, all night into the next morning. Uh, they worked me pretty good. I was laying on the ground. I, 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 was, I mean, they did a number on me. And the door kicked open. And this villager came in. I rolled my head open. I was like, they coming to cut my head off? And he's like, yeah. I was like, well, tell them to come on, man. Three more guys came in there, picked me up, carried me out of that house, down the mountain, and stuck me in this hole and head first and left me there for 27 hours. And that, man, that was rough being isolated like that. I mean, stuff blowing up, boats flying, and you know, people screaming. And I was, man, they took my weapon from me. I, all I had was a dirt clod. I was like, God, it was frustrating. Um, they came and pulled me out of there, and for the next four and a half days, they strategically moved me around that village. I'd be in a room somewhere, and a bullet would zip through the wall, and the wall would blow up. And the villagers would come in there and pick me up and carry me somewhere else. The Taliban had encircled the village. And I didn't know this. Like I said, I never paid attention in class. I didn't know it was a custom, tradition, thousands of years old, that if you wander into, one, into that village and you ask for help, they'll, they'll sacrifice the entire village to keep you alive just because they said they would. It's an honor code. We throw honor around here a little bit free, uh, a little more freely than they do there. I mean, you know, I wish I would have known about it. It alleviated a lot of stress. I thought I was going to die every three minutes. You know what I mean? I mean, they'd have meetings in my room to decide my fate. So many villagers started to die because of, my, because of me, because they w- wouldn't turn me over, that I was like, look, you got to get rid of me, man. you got to give me away. Just, just hand me over. It's not worth it, man. And they were like, no. I said I wouldn't. And... That, that was a, it was just tough. That was a tough pill to swallow. Because I, I remember one of the last, second to last night I was there, I was apologizing to the village elder and a couple of the other guys. I was like, man, hey, I'm sorry for some of the things I've done out here. I was like, I kind of adopted that uh, terrorist mentality. It's like, you know, one American screws up, you blame all of us. I was like, guess what? You guys had some idiots drop some towers in one of my cities. I ain't a city boy, but I took it pretty personal. And right after 9-11, I, was, I just happened to be in this place. There's some military people in there. And this lady was walking around handing out a picture of her daughter. She died in one of the Twin Towers. She had no idea what I did for a living, what, you know, where I was. And all she said to me was, make this right. I kept that picture and I laminated it. And on the back of it, I wrote, no mercy. And before any operation, I would sit on the edge of my bed and jocked up all my kit, my face painted up all sadistic. I'd pull her picture out and stare at her and imagine her dying. Building falling on top of her, catching on fire, skin burning, blood coming out, her screaming for God and for anybody to help her. And I would work myself into such a rage that when I went out there, when I put a bullet into you, that was the nicest thing I did to you. I just remember sitting in that village going, man, I'm sorry for some of the things I've done out here. And he just looked at me. He's like, war is hell. That's what he told me. I was like, yeah. Last day I was there, man, I was laying in this riverbed. Three villagers picked me up. That carried me everywhere. I was paralyzed. And, you know, in the movie, they had me in there. Getting, I was getting my butt handed to me by a Taliban. Well, that happened. But I never killed anybody with a knife. <laughs> so I don't believe everything you see in a movie. <laughs> I mean, right now, I'll tell you the truth. I never killed anybody with a knife. When I got grandkids and I'm old, I'll be like, hell yeah, I did. <laughs> they picked me up. They carried me up the mountain. And I, I had my head down, you know. And all of a sudden, I hear my name in English. I picked my head up. And there's these two army rangers came around the corner. Like, Marcus? I was like, yeah, man, right here, dude. And they, I remember when that guy grabbed me. I never hugged a man. He's probably thinking, like, oh, we, we got you. I was like, yeah, man. Good God, it sure is good to see you guys, man. They picked me up and carried me into this room. They started doctoring me up. You know, they stripped me down, started doctoring me up again. You know, then the joke started flying. And Of course, after about five minutes, I was like, man, I ain't going to never live this down. And rescued by the dang army. <laughs> but uh, Don't get me wrong. I love those guys. And it's one team, one fight in this particular war, man. I mean, you hear the animosity. When uh, military guys, we razz each other. Well, that's just, that's for morale. That's just what we do. It's history. Don't, don't get me wrong. Civilians, you ain't allowed to pick on any other military people. That's something we do as a family. Just keep it, keep it like that. But, uh, man, I, you know, I, arm, it, was, it was Green Berets and those Rangers, man. They, they got me. That was in the morning, July 3rd. That night, around midnight, is when my helicopter came in to get me. Everything I just told you fails in comparison to how crazy that rescue was to get me out of there. That Air Force helicopter actually came in to crash. Complete brownout. He had to land on the side of that mountain. The air was so thin. And plus, there was the, the, the biggest gunfight you've ever, I mean, I had ever seen. Every asset we had in that country was focused straight on us. And he came in and dumped that helicopter. If he'd have if if crabbed that thing to the right three feet, he'd have hit the mountain wall. 
if he'd come to the left two feet, he'd have rolled over on top of us and killed all of us. And he just dumped it right in. It was the most amazing thing. They picked me up, carried me into that helo. The helo dropped off the mountain, took me back to Bagram Air Force Base. And uh, typical military, instead of taking me straight to the hospital, I had to go to a debriefing room. I was like, I could use some medical attention, man. I was like, what's this all about? And they were like, we, <clears throat> there was a problem. When, um, when we were in our engagement, Mikey got the sat phone call off, and when the rest of my platoon came in on another helicopter, when it went to land, a 12-year-old boy shot an RPG into the back of it and blew it out of the sky. I had no idea that happened. The Taliban told me that when they had me, but I didn't believe it. And um, that's how loud it was on our side. I couldn't hear a helicopter getting blown out of the sky and roll down a mountain 10,000 feet. And everybody who knew about our mission, our mission was obviously classified top secret, when anybody who knew about it was on the helo. So when it got shot down, all focus went to the helicopter, and my guys were still laying out there on the ground. I was like, get me a map. You'll find Danny right here, Axe right here, and Mikey right here. They found Mikey and Danny the next day. It took them two days to get him out of there. Couldn't land a helo in there. Too steep. And plus it was under fire. Those PJs went in there and, and snatched him out of there. Brought him home. And then uh, they didn't find Axe. I finally got pushed to a hospital in Germany. I, I, I'm pretty sure I was there for almost 11 days before I got a phone call saying they found Axe. He was three and a half miles from where I said he was. He lived through that RPG blast like I did, and when they finally killed him, they had to take his head. That's when he quit. Or he didn't quit, but that's when, he, when they stopped him. I'm a true testament to those guys, man. They just, they wouldn't stop. I, I was fortunate to only be, I was only shot a couple times. The rest of the guys, man, they were just... Uh, standing up here in front of you, man, I, I don't know why. I was the biggest and the slowest. And um, don't get me wrong, I, you know, I miss my brothers, and I wish they were here for, for their families. But don't feel sorry for them. And, I mean, the, the families understand this, too. My, friend, my teammates died of a, a, a warrior's death, and that's what they were. They died with their boots on and a hell of gunfire, brass everywhere next to their brothers. I mean, as we're, we're made, we don't want to come home and die of cancer, get hit by a drunk driver or anything like that. We want to die with our boots on. And that's the way they went. So don't, 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 don't feel sorry for them at all. Yeah, I know the parent, we miss them and stuff like that, but don't take that away from them. I was in the hospital for a while, a year, getting surgery. Just put me back together so I could go back over. And I deployed back to Iraq and Ramadi in 06, 07 and got my knees blown out. And that cost me my career. I was, we were doing a raid. I was on the third floor. RPG hit the wall. I fell. And that was it. And that's when they retired me. And the hardest thing I ever had to face in my entire life, man, was the day they told me I couldn't be a Navy SEAL anymore. And I'm not ignorant. I'm not indigent by any means. But I knew what I was born to do. I run across people all the time. They tell me, you know, I wish I was doing this, man. But I do this just to make a couple extra bucks. I'm like, man, if you knew how short life was and how fast it could be snatched away from you, you wouldn't waste one second doing anything that didn't bring you absolute enjoyment. Period. And the day they told me I couldn't be a SEAL anymore, man, I was just, good Lord. I, you know, I went home to Texas to the ranch and just milled around there for a couple of years, beating my head against the wall. Thank God I found, you know, my, my wife found me, and, and it's true what they say. I mean, and, and if Trust me, ladies, if you don't hear this enough, we absolutely cannot live without y'all. I don't care what anybody says. Y'all are the toughest species on the planet, and we just can't function without y'all. And it is a good woman that will drag a, a, a man out of the deepest recesses of hell. Because that's where my wife found me. And, uh, yeah, that's it, man. That's, that's kind of Operation Red Wing condensed. So I don't know if I'm sorry if I went over it. Sometimes it's tough to tell this story. But um, thank you all for having me. Deeks family, thank you very much.